Hello and welcome back to another video my friends, my name is Hubble and today we're taking a look at the information we currently know about the missing link title, the background lore that you should know before playing, and all the things that might hint at the story of this untold era. Missing Link is going to be more important to the franchise than most people realize and I hope that some of you who were not previously planning on playing the game for yourself may reconsider after watching this video. Regardless, for the sake of understanding we're going to be taking things step by step here. First we'll do a breakdown of the things that we know to be certain about the game in terms of story and gameplay. Secondly, we'll do a condensed recap of the main events from the Key Saga for those of you who have been holding out or need a refresher as they are absolutely vital. Thirdly, we'll be getting into the key concepts from throughout the series as a whole that still need answers for, and finally, we'll be talking about why any of this matters in the grand scheme of things. Timestamps are going to be in the description and video play bar for your guys' convenience as always, and without further delay, let's jump right in. There's already plenty of information circulating throughout the community of the details of Missing Link, so I'll try to keep this extremely brief. This is going to be the last release of the Key Saga, meaning that everything beyond this point will basically be self-contained within Phase 2 of Kingdom Hearts, or as it's known, the Lost Master Arc. The time frame takes place between the end of Union Cross and the beginning of Dark Road, about four generations after Ephemer initially built Scala Ad Kylum. Scala, as it stands in the game, is divided amongst two main groups of people, those who are from Ephemer's direct lineage and those who are not, or as they are currently referred to by Nomura himself, the Society of Heirs and the Society of Non-Heirs. It was also revealed that Sigurd, the mysterious figure confronting Brain following the events of Union, is the narrator of both Missing Link and Kingdom Hearts 4. We're already starting to get a little bit ahead of ourselves here, so we'll have to circle back to the significance of that in just a little bit. In terms of gameplay, the game will essentially be what I consider to be a more faithful rendition of the elements from the Union series. By this, I mean despite being restricted to a mobile platform, the game will use active 3D combat rendered in an Unreal format just like the Kingdom Hearts we know and love. This being in heavy contrast to the 2D, cheapy style of Union that has been the subject of much criticism, to put it lightly. However, the good elements will be returning, such as a customizable player protagonist as well as Keyblade upgrades and progression. Although, even these familiar concepts seem to be getting a much anticipated rework. For starters, upgrading Keyblades or leveling our personal characters seem to be centered around exploration, which will be accessible through an augmented reality system much like Pokemon Go. Fear not though, you can also use these features through normal gameplay so you don't have to, you know, walk into traffic trying to track down that large body. Not that I'm speaking from experience or, or, any, or anything. Through this exploration, we'll also be able to team up with up to five other players to take down larger objectives, like the dark side we see from the trailer as an example. We'll also be able to teleport around the areas beyond our local geographics. Lastly on this topic, there seems to be either classes or special traits you'll be able to select or build into, which will be nice to diversify the experience from playthrough to playthrough or player to player. Think about how cool it would be to have a skill tree in a Kingdom Hearts game, and just imagine squatting up with the homies in real time to take on massive Heartless. So far, the impressions of Missing Link kinda gives me an augmented reality MMO vibe, and I for one am absolutely living for it. For those of you who might be looking at this as the first Key Saga title that you plan on playing or getting invested into, first of all, I don't really blame you. The hyper-stylized graphics and mobile experience turned most people off of the Union series, as it did for me initially if I'm going to be completely honest with all of you. Not to mention it only took them like 8 years to piece together the story. Although, I will say I am extremely happy that Square is taking one last initiative to onboard people into the juicy lore that the prequel to all the main events has to offer. It is important to note that much like I'm trying to do with this video, it seems like Square is really pushing for this new saga to be highly accessible to both brand new players and veterans of the series alike. Because of this, Missing Link is likely to cover and recap on these events as it provides more detailed explanations, and there's already plentiful resources available out there for those of you who want to know all the intricacies. However, for those of you completely out of the loop or need a refresher course, let's run through some of the details you absolutely have to be aware of before jumping into Missing Link, and consequently, Phase 2 of the series as a whole. The Master of Masters, Lu Xu, and the Foretellers are all currently poised to be the big bad in Phase 2 of the series. Some of the biggest takeaways from Key revolve around the Master of Masters' influence and disappearance, as well as the roles he has given to each of his followers. One of the most prevalent being entrusting Lu Xu with a no-name Keyblade, which holds the Master's eye and protecting the ongoing mystery that is the infamous Black Box. It was Lu Xu's mission to observe all the events to come, and consequently allow the Master to write the Book of Prophecies. The book plays a massive role throughout just about everything else in the series to come, but keeping it in the context of Key here for a second, it allowed the Keyblade wielders of old to draw power from those in the future. The Master granted a copy of the book depicting the events leading up to the Keyblade War to each of his five foretellers along with a specific role. However, he purposefully manipulated each of them with their private roles and bias, which led to some inconsistencies and distrust. 
These elements, paired with the foreboding final passage of the book, sparked panic and resulted in much of the conflict within the saga following the Master's disappearance. That infamous passage read, On that fated land, a great war shall transpire, darkness will prevail, and the light expire. All of these things led to division between the Foretellers and consequently their unions. They ultimately fell right into the trap, planting the seeds for the Keyblade War that allowed Daybreak Town, along with the once-connected Realm of Light, to fragment and become suspended in darkness, as it was written. In preparation for this, the Master gave the Foreteller, Ava, the role of selecting the Dandelions, the Keyblade wielders chosen to escape the Keyblade War and start over, in a new world. Those who traveled to this new world would lose their memories of the war and events prior, a fresh start meant literally. There would also need to be five chosen to succeed the five foretellers in leading these new unions. Ephemer, Scald, Strelitzia, her brother Lorium, and Rain were all chosen for this purpose. However, things didn't really go exactly as planned, or at the very least, not what the anticipated future had in store. Leading up to the Keyblade War, Strelitzia went in search of us, our personal character, to save us from the fate of the world. During this search, Strelitzia was confronted by a darkness-possessed Ventus, who killed her and took not only her rulebook, but her rightful place as one of the new union leaders. Ava was also instructed by the Master of Masters to give a copy of the Book of Prophecies to Ephemer, but instead she chose Brain. In doing this, hoping to change the foretold future by changing the events that should have taken place. As things turned out, we actually chose to stay behind and fight in that Keyblade War, being saved from the brink of death by Ephemer and Scald, who both came back from their new world and returned with us. Fast forwarding through many events, both for the sake of time and for the sake of baiting some of you into looking into the full story for yourselves, the alternate world these dandelions were taken into and those in which they explored were actually data versions vaguely connected to each of their real counterparts. Over time, they began to realize that they were now trapped in this fake universe for lack of better terminology and became aware that things were not going as intended as they slowly began recollecting their memories. We are later introduced to the Arcs, a sequence of lifepod-like machines designed to transport people's hearts, allowing them to traverse both locations and time itself. These were believed to be the key to finding a way to free all of the dandelions. Some of our new leaders, along with Elrena, used these pods to go back to the real world, leaving behind Ephemer, Scald, and our character. Before taking their leave, though, Brain gives Ephemer the Master's Defender Keyblade and a copy of the Book of Prophecies. Upon arriving in the now crumbling real world, Brain chose to stay there and convince the others to take the Arcs to safety. Immediately following this, Brain is approached by Lushu, who inquires about the other Union leaders and Brain's plan. In this discussion, Lushu explains the futility of Brain's ambitions. Their meeting ends rather ominously as Lushu states, It's a shame this lifetime is the only one you've got. And the scene fades to black. In the data world, our other parties confronted by physical beings of darkness. In what was an emotional roller coaster, the fates of all these characters were more or less decided. Our character trapped themselves along with the darknesses and the link between the data worlds. Lorium and Arena arrived at separate worlds in the future, eventually getting mixed up in Organization 13, and Ventus was to be found unconscious in the Keyblade graveyard by Xehanort, where the story of Birth by Sleep picks up. Scald also traveled to the future, where it is all but confirmed that she was taken captive by Ansem and given the name Project X, as we've seen throughout the secret reports in Kingdom Hearts 3. Ephemer, however, did not travel as far ahead as the others. He emerges from his pod to the complete wreckage that is, or rather was, Daybreak Town. Although the specifics are unclear, we know that Ephemer went on to create Scala Ad Kylum, or Stairway to Heaven, as the name so prominently translates from Latin. What happened to Brain is to this date a point of contention which we'll have to circle back to soon. Hopefully some of you learned something so far, or have gained more interest in the more lesser known or underappreciated Kingdom Hearts lore. To be completely honest, I think that this is almost a criminally simplified version of the magnificent, emotion-filled story that is the Key Saga. For those of you who want to know more about it, I highly recommend checking out Damo here on YouTube. He has an amazing content library covering all of the main stories, as well as some incredibly detailed explanations and theories. He's the reason that I first got invested into the Key Arc, leading me to a deeper appreciation for the Kingdom Hearts universe as a whole. Lastly, on the subject of shoutouts, I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos and making them enjoyable and easily digestible. A super easy way to make sure that I know my efforts are appreciated is to hit that like and subscribe button real quick. Seriously, only a few seconds of your time goes a very long way to putting a guaranteed smile on my face and also it lets me know what kind of content you guys want more of. I appreciate those of you who've been sticking with me thus far, but now it's time to get into the nitty gritty of the story left to be told, the questions left unanswered. Aside from the ambiguous fate of some of the dandelions, going through the key and dark seeker sagas, there are plenty of open-ended questions yet to be explained. I'm sure that Square is very much aware of the meta title that they selected here because Missing Link will do exactly what it says it will. Do you get it? 
connect the missing pieces of lore and link them together. <laughs> oh dear god, please stop cringing. Just let me have some comedic relief after all the abuse I put myself through in dealing with this franchise. I hate it so much, but at the end of the day, I love it even more. Jokes aside, by looking at these gaps, we can at the very least speculate what the main story of Missing Link will consist of, or at the very least what it will provide answers to. To start things off here, there's still a lot of questions yet to be answered on the Book of Prophecies. While we know that the Foretellers had copies, and that Brain had access to a copy before giving it to Ephemer, there are other forces at play here. Through interactions within the series, we know that at least one of the physical manifestations of darkness, Maleficent, Xehanort, and Lushu all know about or read parts of it. Trying to leave my own speculation out of it, we don't exactly know how far their knowledge of the book reaches, or just how much of the future these copies contained. Since Ephemer created Scala, and Sigurd knew of Brain's return, we can safely assume that the book was passed down through the Society of Heirs. And, from Brain and Ephemer's final encounter, it's very likely that the Master's Defender, as well as access to the Book of Prophecies, will be returned to Brain, all as Ephemer intended. In Missing Link, we're probably going to be getting a deeper look into just how much the book foretells of the future, and how the society within Scala is trying to potentially prepare for and or alter the written fate. I also think that it'll be within the events of Missing Link that Lushu will somehow gather more information on this book, and we may also see further clarification as to the knowledge held by the others. Ultimately, we will get to know more about the Book of Prophecies in general. Its power, its contents, its influence, its keepers, and its path as it physically works its way through the timeline. Before fully switching gears here, a few more things need to be addressed in regards to Brain. Did he do what he did because he truly let his heart be his guiding key? Or did he use his knowledge of the Book of Prophecies to manipulate the events in everyone's favor? And if so, why would he lie to Ephemer about reading it before his departure? All of that aside, we still need to know what actually happened to Brain, and no, I'm not talking about his arrival at Scala, although that is something we need to know more about, but what happened between him and Lushu in Daybreak Town? Who is the one we see carrying the black box and no name, and why does he look like Brain? Brain can't be in two places at once, right? Or like, can he? I simply refuse to talk about these connections anymore because I am like one sentence away from going off on a tinfoil hat conspiracy fueled tirade. This is what I mean when I say I have a love-hate relationship with Kingdom Hearts. You get my point though. Brain is a seriously heavy hitter when it comes to the ancient Keyblade legacy and one of Missing Link's central focuses is going to have to be tying up all of his loose ends. Then come the mysteries of Scala at Kylum itself. We don't know what happened following Ephemer's emergence that led to an entire repopulated civilization. Either he or someone else had to have found a way to save the rest of the dandelions. Otherwise, the concepts of heirs and non-heirs wouldn't be so relevant. Maybe it's even possible that people from around the Realm of Light somehow found their way there after their now divided worlds were consumed by darkness, similar to how Traverse Town worked in Kingdom Hearts 1. Looking at a completely different factor besides population alone, why is the Scala we see and explore through Kingdom Hearts 3 and Dark Road vastly different from the one Ephemer built? The Scala we know from the more modern times is a rather lavish yet desolate environment, whereas the Scala we see in the Key Saga looks more grim and gothic but is apparently filled with life. Did one evolve into the other, or is the Scala Xehanort and Ericus remember so fondly just a cover up for something else entirely, much like how Castle Oblivion was created to protect Ventus and the Land of Departure? The one literal and figurative key that connects these events together is the Master's Defender Keyblade. It went from Brain to Ephemer, assumingly back to Brain, and then where? All we know for sure is that somewhere along its journey, it was passed into the hands of Master Ericus, as it was implied that it was hand down through lineage. Again, I'm gonna have to bite my tongue here, but whatever the case, as I'm sure you've probably guessed, I think we're gonna get more hints. Changing gears here for the last section, there's also a very good chance that we will officially see the origin stories of both Demix and Luxord. From their conversation with Marluxia and Larxene, Xemnas confirmed that all four of them hold the ancient Keyblade legacy within them. For some, it's obvious, Marluxia and Larxene being the nobodies of Lorium and Alreina, but how exactly does our blonde duo correlate into any of this? I am all but 100% certain that Missing Link is going to have the answer. Taking a little bit of a closer look here, while all of the organization's memories are scrambled, the scene from Luxord's defeat at the end of Kingdom Hearts 3 in particular provides some interesting insight. When he regains his memory and part of his humanity, he is nothing but hopeful. He tosses Sora a card and says that it's a wild card, you've earned it, hang on to it could turn the tables. After a quick lighthearted exchange and a game proposition from Sora, Luxord accepts and a big smile reaches across his face just before he dissipates. Then there's the secret ending of the game, where we see clear as day that Luxord, or rather his real self, is positioned right in the forefront of the events moving forward. 
It's obvious his time in the organization was all just a means to an end, and I'm looking forward to seeing how this will be expanded upon in Missing Link. While Demix remains one of the more elusive members, I think that both characters will have a substantial role in connecting the timelines, and who knows, maybe we'll even get teased with more information regarding Yuzora's true identity. All we can do for now is just wait and see how it all plays out for ourselves come time for more information or the release itself. The point of this video is to not make any declarative statements of what the game will hold, but rather to kind of bring to the forefront of everyone's mind these possibilities. It was excessively hard for me to not turn all these points into long, self-contained theories. If hearing me draw more concrete connections between these topics is something you're interested in, let me know in the comments. Lord knows that I have a laundry list of ideas for making this video. Moving past all of this, like I said in my last theory, when Nomura is involved, everything is connected, and this time, they straight up put it right there in the trailer. To further emphasize the importance of all these events in wake of Phase 2, let's take a step back and look at all the pieces that have already started colliding. I'm sure a lot of you out there are already starting to see the significance. Love it or hate it, Kingdom Hearts 3 got something right. It set a massive stage for connecting together all of the lore and making everything relevant for Phase 2. And if I'm going to be perfectly transparent with you guys yet again, I actually didn't enjoy my first playthrough very much. I felt like key details were sporadic, lazy, and a little confusing. But when I came back after getting an understanding of what took place in the key saga, my opinion was completely flipped. I highly recommend those of you who currently feel that way do the same. Personal anecdotes aside, let's get right back into things. Some of the more obvious examples include the reappearance of Ephemer, the Foretellers, and the Master of Masters. We also get the powerful reveal that Zigbar is actually Lushu in hiding, watching over Xehanort and his Keyblade No Name in a close, inconspicuous fashion, all while leading a side quest to reobtain the Black Box. While the Black Box itself is still one of the biggest mysteries in Kingdom Hearts as a whole, igniting speculation across the community, I honestly don't think we'll get any answers or even hints in Missing Link for that matter. I think the same is also true for the real intentions of the Master of Masters and the identity of the true Dandelion. While all of these things are surely unanswered questions worth drawing attention to, I didn't include them in the previous segments because I couldn't find a way to mix them in without spawning more confusion in context. I'm sure that Phase 2 will revolve heavily around these mysteries, all spawning from the days of ancient legacy. Some connections, while equally important, are much more subtle. For starters, the Master's Defender Keyblade at this point is certainly much more than a simple cameo from throughout the series. After all, following Ericus, it was then passed on to Aqua, and then in an abstract way to Sora, and then back to Aqua, who placed it as a memorial in the Land of Departure where it currently rests. Saying much more about it definitely hinges on speculation, but I definitely think its importance is underappreciated and Missing Link just might have some more insight. All I'll say for now is that I think the histories of Scala, the Destiny Islands, and the Land of Departure are more closely related than they may seem. Consequently, the Wayfinder trio may have some deeper connections across the series yet to be explored. We also can't forget about Project X. Operating under the fairly safe assumption that it is indeed Scald, Lushu found her and set her free, although her current whereabouts are not known. Lushu may have recognized who she was, and maybe he's manipulating her behind the scenes, gaining her trust being one of the only people from her time period. While I'm very eager to see exactly how things will pan out, for now we don't even know if it'll be for better or for worse. If she plays a part of the Master's grand plan, she could be used as leverage against the others. However, keep in mind, Lushu is a traitor. Maybe he plans on working with her to stop the Master's plot, seeing as Lushu himself was very reluctant to the sacrifices and lengths the Master was willing to commit to. Again, only time will tell. I also want to touch back on the significance of Sigurd. I assure you, it is no coincidence whatsoever that another person from the past has his hand in events that take place in the future. While there is still a lot of discussion out on this one, and believe you me, I have theories of my own, it is another obvious example of just how important the key saga is going to be in driving the plot of the next arc of the series. Speaking of arc, it's also worth mentioning that the arcs themselves have now made their way into a number of games, further proving my point. Like it or not, Kingdom Hearts doesn't really have many side games. At the end of the day, important details are buried within and taken from every individual story to make the whole. That concept in itself is one of the core things that makes this series so special to me and draws it near and dear to my heart. Growing up with the series and seeing the level of depth built around what I had surely thought would be just another fond memory etched into my childhood makes me rejoice. I've recently seen a lot of negativity in the community revolving certain titles, particularly whenever the term mobile is involved. 
While Union Cross was an unfortunate gotcha game, I really do think Square learned their lesson and will be making many, many improvements moving into their new mobile title. Whether you're new to the series or a seasoned veteran, I for one am very excited to be sharing my free-to-play Missing Link journey with all of you when the time comes. I really do hope that I open some of you up into getting involved in this game, and for those of you who already planned on playing it, I hope I instilled more hype. Let me know what your thoughts are moving forward into Phase 2, or if you learned something today in the comments. Be sure to share this video with someone who needs a little bit more convincing, and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any Kingdom Hearts content to come, as a lot of you guys watching tend to forget. To my returning viewers who are waiting for this video to drop, I sincerely apologize. I hit a lot of physical hardware roadblocks when making this video, so I had to redo basically every little part three times over. Regardless, I'm super happy with how it turned out, and I hope you guys think it was worthwhile. If you want input on or want to know more about upcoming projects and things going on behind the scenes, be sure to follow me on Twitter. You can find all of my socials in one convenient link in the description below. You've all been blowing my mind with the support recently, and I want to thank you again for hearing me out today. Until I see you back here again, always remember, no matter how dark things may seem, whether it be a world of fiction or reality, keep looking up. The Master of Masters, Lu Shu, and the Foretellers are currently poised to be the big, the big, oh gosh.